Our purpose is to build a holistic voice that creates a community of like-minded, healthy people for a healthier planet. Our goal is to unify the community, nourishing the growth in mind, body, spirit, awareness, and wellness. We want to engage our community and visitors so they have access to powerful momentum of the holistic presence in our community. We do this by creating awareness through interviews, providing education and awareness of cutting-edge modalities. We also provide access for consumers to quality natural health and wellness professional and practitioners and like-minded business that support this community. Thank you for listening with us on Healthy Planet One. Stay with us for the next interview with our next holistic guest. Welcome, everyone. This month's focus is on let the light in. So this topic is very diverse, and we have four uh, guests we've invited to share their insight and their contributions through their various fields. We invite you to listen in each week to their in-depth conversations that we're sure will make a big difference in your life. So our guests this week, we're very excited to have Jackie Simmons. She is the founder of the Suicide Prevention Society and Success Journey Academy. She is a very uh, successful author and speaker and a game changer, which we love Jackie for. Um, she's learned the hard way that most people call sales and and uh, what most people call sales doesn't work for her. And as a result, she became an expert from sales from the inside out. And now she's delved into the topic of a teen suicide. And she is here today to talk to us about her new project. We're very excited for you guys to learn about this. So, Jackie, let hey. me hear yeah, let's hear what's so exciting. Let's hear about this taboo conversation. I want to hear. <laughs> yeah, when you talk about letting the light in, this uh -huh. is a conversation that could use some light shining on it. Mm -hmm. In August, a 37-year-old stood up and delivered a seven-minute talk for feedback, which wonderful. She started with the startling statistic, and as her speaking coach, I was very pleased until her words landed. Her statistic was 3,000. Over 3,000 teens attempt to take their own lives every day. And that's just in the US. And that's just the ones we know about. And when that statistic landed, I realized that we're losing a generation. As shocking as that was, her next Session, her next sentence was even more shocking because it started with when I was 14 and she went in to talk about her multiple suicide attempts and my brain was exploding because this is not the topic of polite conversation. You know, I come from the don't air your dirty laundry in public mm -hmm. and it's not a lot dirtier than suicide. So I'm reeling and then she says she still struggles with suicidal thoughts she manages to find joy every day, but she still struggles. Now, 30 years of stress management training is the only reason I was still in my chair and not curled up in the corner just howling, because that 37-year-old young woman is my daughter. And I had thought when we were done with interventions that she was okay. So I'm sitting in the back of my of the room at my own event, giving her feedback on a talk that has just ripped the heart out of my chest. And the only thing that saved me was that she finished her talk with how she wanted to create a program to help teens find joy every day, even if they struggle with suicidal thoughts. And in that instant, the Teen Suicide Prevention Society was born. We launched the Make It a Great Day movement. Since August, we've published the Make It a Great Day, The Choice is Yours book. And what I am so excited about is that we are starting the conversations. Everyone is starting to break the silence around us. And next month, we're launching the Suicide Prevention Mentor Certification Program so that people will have training 
in how to start a conversation, how to help other people break the silence, and how to hold a space where it's safe to talk about this. Because we know if we can get our teens talking, we can keep them here. Oh, this is very beautiful. This is so this is very special and beautiful um, because I I know people that have you know exposed this to me. Um, what's the biggest obstacle that you're seeing in creating awareness to this uh, silent epidemic, as you refer to it? The biggest obstacle is the cultural conversation that says, "Get over it. You don't need to talk about it." There, you know, somebody's going, other people's opinions actually hold us hostage here. What will the neighbors think? And for all that we think we are over that in our culture, we've just created a bigger neighborhood. Now it's what will my Facebook friends think? What will it look like? Because once it's on social media, it's there forever. And so we're polarizing in our culture on this topic of is it safe to talk about? And I will tell you that there are rules and regulations in certain industries and professions where if you tell them, if you open up and say that you're having suicidal thoughts, by law, they have to report you. Oh, wow. So it goes then, way beyond the blame when they, and the shame. When they report you, what, yeah. what happens when they report you, Jackie? Well, it depends on the state you're in. The universal guideline is it's a three-day hold, which means they come and they pick you up and they put you into a safe, secure environment for three days until you can be evaluated by a licensed psychiatrist. Right. Now, on the surface, this sounds like a really good idea because it keeps people safe. In reality, in some states, those three days are just their rule for getting their paperwork turned in. You could actually be held for weeks. Oh, my gosh. But the the trauma of being held like that, I would think, would be detrimental. It stops people from speaking up and seeking help. And here's the biggest challenge. Suicidal thoughts are normal. They're part of the natural negative bias of the brain. It's the worst case scenario mechanism that kept our ancestors safe and that we inherited as part of the original operating equipment. The brain, as we're born, has this hardwired into it. There's nothing wrong with it. If you have the ability to be aware that there's nothing wrong with it, that you can process this safely. So this goes along with our our um, innate uh, need to avoid pain, I would imagine. It goes along with our natural negative bias that the caveman says, purple plant. What do I know about purple plant? I eat purple plant, I get sick. Me no eat purple plant. Mm -hmm. It's a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. And our prefrontal cortex that we have and the caveman didn't is designed to help us mitigate it. But the problem is we're not teaching emotional awareness and resilience at an early enough age, and then we're trying to manage our emotions from this aftermarket part where we reason and rationalize, and it's not working so well. Right. Especially in teens, because while the prefrontal cortex is there, it's not fully developed until they're in their mid-20s, if we're lucky. If we're lucky, that's true. <laughs> you, know, you know, Jackie, when you said, when you just spoke, suicidal thoughts are normal, my insides went, ah! Oh, my God, normal. How can that be normal? Right. And that's what you're talking about. The prefrontal cortex sending that message like you got to tighten up and you got to fly. You got to get the hell out of here. Right. <laughs> you you get we we all have a fight or flight mechanism. Mm -hmm. And however you respond, however you've adapted, fight, flight, freeze or faint doesn't matter. We all have the mechanism when we are taught that emotions are not permanent. When we're taught that emotions are actually a guidance system to help us know if we're on track or off track, on purpose or off purpose, if we are taught that at an early age, this isn't a problem. If we're not taught that, then emotions, instead of becoming guideposts, become a death sentence. And we're seeing it happen more and more and at younger and younger ages. So would you say that the um, the 
lack of connectedness that we're having, even with parents and children, and the more of, amount of technology that has been shown to have an effect, the negative effect on the prefrontal cortex, would you say that plays into this a little bit? A little bit. Well, anything that inhibits the growth of the prefrontal cortex and that development is going to have an, an impact. I mean, let's face it, we are a society that worships the mind. And what they mean by that is they mean the rational, scientific, you know, design that we can rationalize and reason and look at all of those concepts that we are coming up with and the amazing technology. So it's not that technology is bad. It's just that we have to be aware that it's inhibiting the growth of the prefrontal cortex because we're not stimulating it with conversation. Yeah. and multi-generational interactions the way that we were a generation or two ago. Yeah, and, and I've seen uh, research into the mindfulness awareness and the meditation that actually helps to stimulate the prefrontal cortex. Have you seen any of that? Or have you seen that in relation to, um, you know, in uh, kind of healing, the healing process? We're going to go really quickly into this because I want everyone to get this. Mm -hmm. When we're in fight or flight and we're triggered often, we are stealing our brain's ability to reason because in fight or flight, there's no blood flow to the prefrontal mm -hmm. cortex. It's inhibited, oh, okay. and that's by design. It uh -huh. kept our ancestors alive. Right. Meditation, deep breathing. The reason I partnered with the people who created the Pulmonica, which is a breathing retraining device that improves right. lung function, is right. because when you take deep breaths, you're actually calming this whole fight or flight response in the brain. Right. So all of these things make a positive difference. The biggest benefit is that when you calm down, you can have a conversation. You can simply talk again with another person without reacting. Yeah. Without calming down, we're in reactive mode because our bodies are flooded with adrenaline, epinephrine, cortisol all the time. I've been there, so I know. Yeah. And so I've had thoughts, I had thoughts in my teens. So, I mean, it's, a, it's not – I can fully get it. So, yeah. Jackie, I love it when you said uh, – when we go into fight or flight, there's no blood flow to the frontal lobe. So we're putting our energy into stimulating uh, our adrenal glands and uh, getting the hell out of there. Is that is that where that goes? Yeah, absolutely. When people talk about adrenal fatigue or they've blown out their adrenal glands, what they're meaning is that they have lived for so long and wow. being triggered in the fight or flight mode that uh -huh. their adrenal glands literally have worn out. Back in the caveman day, as soon as the stimulus was handled, as soon as Og, our common ancestor, was back in his cave, what did he do? <gasps> he took some deep breaths. His body immediately reset by sending the chemicals into his bloodstream that counterbalanced the adrenaline. What are we doing in our day and age? We get triggered. Are we using our big muscles and stimulating deep breathing? No, we're freezing and holding our breath. And then they're going on social media to make it even worse. <laughs> and and then they're reinforcing the stimulus. And so what's happening is that the cortisol, the adrenaline, has to start naturally degrading. And that takes 24 hours. Now, do, when was the last time you went 24 hours without getting triggered? As yeah. often as I can. Yes. Yeah, I that's why I avoid, I avoid TV. I avoid. So, I avoid so, so. Let me, let me ask the this question. Is how do we live in the day and age of social media and high technology and not blow out our adrenal glands, not right. get caught up in the like trigger, re-trigger, trigger, re-trigger, and the way out of that is first emotional awareness, first being aware that your emotions are supposed to guide you. And the second is do a few simple things. Meditation is good. Deep breathing. People can go to the Mission Driven Mentors, the Make It a Great Day book site. They can get a pulmonica and not only benefit themselves and their stress, but help the Teen Suicide Prevention Society at the same time. There are things you can do that are really simple 
they all require 